while troops in the subcontinent readied to defend their home. Indians abroad helped liberate North Africa before participating in Operation Husky, seeing action throughout Sicily. Right, y'all, welcome back to Combat Arms Channel. Okay, so today we're checking out a video from the Armchair Historian, and this one is going to be pretty cool because this is something I pretty much know nothing about. So this is about World War II from India's perspective. And again, like trying to recall anything, I don't think I can really say a whole lot about India during World War II. Now, I did go to the Imperial War Museum in London, and I think some of the Victoria Cross citations were talking about some Indian soldiers, but I'm not exactly sure. I could be completely wrong on that. It might have just been like Gurkhas. So yeah, I'm not really too sure, to be honest. So hopefully this video sheds some light. It's about 22 minutes long, which is pretty decent. And again, it's the armchair historian, so it's probably going to be some pretty good stuff. So let's check it out. With the outbreak of war in Europe and the Far East, every corner of our empire must stand ready to answer the call of king and country. And nowhere is affection for his Britannic majesty stronger than in the fabled lands of India. Okay. As our government's policy of in So already we're getting a lot of Great Britain and India. So I imagine the Indian soldiers were recruited, recruited into the British armed forces. I'm not really too sure. I never even knew that, but that's what it's looking like so far. Indianization takes root. The natives assume greater control over their destiny as we march together into battle against the foes of our common empire. Ooh. The great breadbasket of our far-off empire happily keeps us in raw material, with enough food, cotton, and rubber to keep our boys fighting forever. Okay. No sacrifice is too great for victory. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. When one thinks of British participation in the Second World War, images of Tommies in their Brody helmets slogging through the dust of <laughs> Egypt or charging the beaches of Normandy spring to mind. Others may picture the Maroon Berade boys of the Airborne descending on Pegasus Bridge, or gentlemen spies like the late Sir Christopher yeah. Lee slinking through the shadows of occupied Europe. What a legend, These images man is. all have one thing in common, however. Their protagonists are universally Anglo-Saxon. In reality, mm. the Second World War was a clash of empires, empires who called upon all of their people to take up arms and fight for the survival of their dominion. Very true. For the British Empire, this included over 370 million people of India, their largest colony, and Damn. a much-touted jewel in the imperial crown. In today's episode, we'll take- Damn, India's population must have went insane after world war ii because what 370 million that's pretty much what the u.s has like right now but this was india and this was like 80 years ago so yeah i know india has way more people than the u.s right now so that's pretty crazy to think about so i'm loving the background already the armchair historian they do a really good job of like setting the stage and sort of setting the scene and the vibe and that's pretty cool we even got the the flags over here i'm not too familiar with that one it doesn't look like the Indian flag now, so I'm not exactly, I mean, I guess that makes a lot of sense, but I've not seen that way yet, so that's kind of cool. Take a look at the Second World War from the perspective of the jewel rather than the head that wore it, and how this conflict hmm. realized Indian independence. Hell yeah. During any major conflict, information can be just as valuable as bullets. The Axis powers in yeah, particular no sunk vast amounts of resources into the science of encryption. But while the vaunted mm. Enigma machine was eventually cracked by allied codebreakers, our sponsor NordVPN promises <laughs> to keep your data safe and anonymous while I love browsing that. the internet. With Man. over 5,200... If I was a sponsor, I would absolutely pay these guys because they do a really good job of just taking the video and actually relating it to the ad. So yeah, well done. <laughs> The India of 1939 was a vastly different place than mm. we know today. The British colonial government, or Raj, was a racially segregated and socially stratified body with a white ruling class held above the native Indians. Mm. Okay. The caste system assisted in maintaining social control. Whites only businesses were common and Indian people were even prohibited from entering certain districts of cities in their own country. Mm. Despite these prohibitions, a kind of Indian middle class developed. 
professionals who managed to work within the system to find some measure of security and prosperity. Huh. A young Gandhi belonged to this class as an up-and-coming <laughs> oh, lawyer. Oh snap, okay, that's cool. However, the vast majority huh. of Indians were, to put it mildly, dissatisfied with the system. Perhaps yeah, sensing the sense. rising tide of anti-colonial sentiment, the Raj began a policy of Indianization in the 1920s and 30s, which saw more and more native Indians placed in government and military positions. Okay. Of particular hmm. note was the introduction of Indian officers to the local military forces, which until this point had been under exclusively white command. These native officers were often placed in charge of all Indian units, while on their face, these reforms were billed as steps towards self-rule and Indian success, the reality was that they were token concessions to silence nationalist rumblings, a way for mm. the British to simultaneously okay. mollify their critics and maintain control. Britannia rules the Indians as they rule the waves. This was, to the Raj's nice. mind, a fact. Hmm, okay. So from the American history perspective, of course, I can really only relate this to like segregation and whatnot, but like with the civil rights era, there's more of people speaking out as opposed to the government offering certain things like this. It's kind of similar, but again, India was its own country at the time, so a little bit different, I would say. The Second World War would put this fact to the test. The fall of Poland in 1939 brought the infamous Sitzkrieg and eight months of little change to the subcontinent. Okay. This gave the people of India time to reflect, time to begin seeing the war in Europe as a far-off matter, a news item that wouldn't touch their homeland. Hmm. Like the United States, India was thousands of miles from Europe, protected by sea and desert, mountain <laughs> and plain. Nice. Being in India was like being in a grandstand watching some game or other, according to British civil service officer Hay McDonald. That's funny. That's a McDonald's cool way of putting it. McDonald's attitude was not a popular one, however. Many of his compatriots were firmly fixed on joining the coming fight. Mm. Thus, the British ordered the Indian Army mobilized at the start of the war in 1939, with Viceroy of India, Lord Linlithgow, believing wholeheartedly that the Indian people would sign on in droves to fight for democracy and freedom, <laughs> and country. We'll see. Indeed, one group of native Indians came flocking to the Union Jack, okay. the wealthy Maharajas of the princely states. Within the structure huh. of the Raj, roughly one third of the native population was ruled over by Indian princes who administered fiefdoms in the empire's name. Okay. When Linlithgow called, the Maharajas saw an opportunity to shore up their power in the face <laughs> of the rising Indian independence okay, movement. I get it. The princes viewed Indian nationalism as an existential threat and hoped that by eagerly and vigorously supporting the British crown, their survival would be guaranteed in an independent India. Uh. <laughs> Revolutions, even peaceful ones, are often unkind to the crowned heads. Yeah, no kidding. The princes <laughs> raised battalions of infantry and artillery, or funneled their wealth into the British war chest. Scores of princes writing yeah. six-figure checks to the British Air Ministry and other departments. That's so weird to think about. With their but... men and their money, these yeah. old royals hoped to preserve their preeminence in Indian society, be it under British rule or in a free Indian state. Average Indians the game, I were guess, equally interested but... <laughs> in the conflict, and public opinion was surprisingly varied over who was in the right. India at this time included a variety of ethnic and religious groups, groups that did not always coexist peacefully. Mm -hmm. The cause of Indian independence sometimes ran along these religious and ethnic lines, and Hitler's idea of racial purity found willing adoptees in the militant wings of the Indian independence movement. Really? Huh. Such Hitlerians included the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sankh Hindu nationalist group who openly celebrated Adolf Weird. Hitler and his desire for racial purity, as well as his methods in obtaining it. That's like super weird to think about. I mean, again, India is so far away, but again, Hitler was extremely popular during World War II, so I guess a lot of his word ended up spreading all over the place very, very quickly. So it's kind of weird to think that he had supporters in India. I didn't even like consider that, but yeah, it seemed like there was a few different, like, what, factions? I'm not exactly sure what he referred to them as, but I don't think that's really going to work out considering Great Britain was, like, ruling over India at the time. And, of course, Great Britain 
did not think this dude was very kosher, so hey, I wonder how that kind of worked out for those different factions. Meanwhile, those Indians who favored the Allies found themselves increasingly frustrated with the British, who should have been their compatriots. Hmm. While Indian politicians were anxious to defend their homes and promote their people's prosperity, the British showed interest in India solely as a well of manpower from which to draw colonial troops. Yeah. Hopes Makes of a sense. new cooperation came in 1940 when the British and Indian governments reached an astonishing agreement. Okay. London would pay for the entirety of India's war expenses and flood the colony with investment. Huh. The British would foot the bill for recruitment and transport of Indian soldiers that does and bankroll sweeping infrastructure improvements. But London's generosity proved hollow. The British paid their debts with sterling credits, essentially government IOUs that forced India to front the actual money, devastating oh, okay. the Indian economy. Oh, sterling when credits. When the British government enacted the what defense is of India. Sterling Queens. Act granting government <laughs> officials unlimited power to crack down on any sentiment, speech, or action they considered disloyal, the imperial government's priorities were spelled out. Hmm. Focus on the war and keep India under political and economic control. Okay. While the British worked to consolidate control on the home front, Indian soldiers found their life in the field surprisingly varied. The social hmm. dynamics of some units were perfect mirrors of the Raj, with white officers enforcing How does that work? a kind of de facto what? segregation. Disputes broke out over pay discrepancies between white and Indian officers of equal rank, the content of ration tins, and even whether radios should Whoa. be tuned to Western or Indian musical stations. Wait, how does that work? That seems like way more of a pain in the ass to to try and front, especially during World War II, where I mean, you got to think the conditions weren't very good. So, I mean, it wasn't really accommodating to have all these different space and all these different facilities, especially with these different segregated facilities. So I'm not exactly sure how that worked out and different pay. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's definitely going to be an issue for a lot of people, but then like different ration packs too. Again, it just seems like more effort than it's worth, but I don't know, I guess different times. While this form of petty, racially driven office politics was a rule in some units, others turned out to be surprisingly progressive for the era. A common rule for these units was the prohibition of speaking in derogatory terms in the presence of Indian officers about their political leaders, customs, traditions, or music, while hmm. others accepted their Indian peers of their own accord once they'd proven their mettle and competence in the field. Hell yeah. This attitude began to work its way up to the lines, with the Infantry Committee penning a report midway through the war identifying segregation within units as a critical issue. Hmm. The most strenuous For efforts sure. must be made to ensure that no discrimination of any nature is permitted. Yeah, I mean, okay, dude, in the infantry, there is no place for that sort of mentality. Like, if you're if you're not going to fight with this dude, if you're not going to accept what he is and that he's doing the exact same thing as you, then it's not going to work out and you're probably not going to last very long, especially in World War II. Like, in the infantry now, it's not going to work out. But World War II, where you're constantly in, you know, crappy conditions, fighting for your life... Yeah, there is no room for that. By the end of the war, 2.5 million Indians would fight for the British Empire, providing a critical component Golly. of the Allied forces that defeated the Jeez. Axis powers. Powers that succeeded in bringing the war to India's doorstep. Yeah, it shows with all the Victoria Imperial Crosses, Japan's too. Imperial Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor was like a bucket of icy water dumped onto India's head. Up till now, the people of India thought the Second World War would play out much like the first, with Indian troops sent to far-off lands and the subcontinent spared of actual fighting. Mm. The Japanese were all too happy to disabuse India of this notion and Pearl Harbor was followed by an East Asian blitzkrieg that toppled colonial government after colonial government. The Japanese carved a beachhead into India's neighbor, Burma, and seized Hong Kong, oh, Singapore, snap. and British Malaya. India, therefore, became a crucial staging ground for the Allies in the Pacific, and refugees okay. fled the Japanese advance for the perceived safety of the Raj, a flow which only intensified after the Japanese captured the Burmese capital in March. Damn, okay, so yeah, By they're the getting pretty the month, close. The Japanese had captured all of Burma and cut the critical overland supply route from India to China. 
Burma's fall opened India up to a direct Japanese invasion, oh, with I did Bengal not know. first on the block. Did not Panic know that. swept through this province. In this desperate hour, as their imperial subjects were racked with fear, the British Raj stepped in to restore calm by hmm. enacting a scorched earth policy that devastated the civilian population. Oh, no kidding. Food stockpiles were seized by government forces, bridges were destroyed, civilian watercraft confiscated or sunk, waterways sabotaged. Huh. If the Japanese invaded Bengal, they would inherit a ruin. However, the okay, Japanese had reached approach. the end of their supply lines in Burma and were unable to advance in India, so they bombed it. As British oh, soldiers man. sacked what they should have been defending and Japanese ordnance fell from the sky, the people of Bengal found themselves straddling a tightrope over the bottomless chasm of starvation. So again, there was a lot happening during World War II, obviously, since it was a, a world war. So you can't always be savvy about what happened with every specific region. But again, there's a lot of stuff like this that you're just not really aware of. And I wonder if you guys are from the UK, let me know what you're actually taught about World War II and what was actually happening in India as far as like this specific territory, if they actually teach that. Because yeah, I would imagine they're probably talking about like the Battle of Britain more than a lot of other things. So yeah, let me know if you guys actually got taught anything about like India and what was happening as far as like the Japanese coming up on the territory. ...a tightrope over the bottomless chasm of starvation. Fishermen had no craft with which to ply their trade. Hmm. Farmers had no crops nor way to get them to market if they did. Damn. In 1942, the ravening claws of hunger would snare India in their clutches. The Bengal famine had begun. The Ooh, famine was okay. a tragedy within a tragedy, an epidemic of hunger and disease that saw between two to three million people die. While the dominant Damn. narrative for some time has been that extreme weather was a leading cause of the tragedy, more modern research seems to indicate British policies in India as the chief cause of the famine. Indian American scientist and journalist Madhushri Mukherjee posits that over exploitation of Indian resources by British leadership directly caused the famine, hmm. with London continuing to pull tons of rice from India even as leaders of the Raj begged for emergency food aid. Hmm. Again, I had no idea that, that actually happened. So. Hordes of refugees from Burma poured into India, increasing demand for what food was available. Hmm. Fungus devastated rice crops, severely limiting edible produce. British industrialists Jeez. and landowners intervened, engaging in profiteering during the crisis. Freak weather devastated farmland and wiped out villages. And lastly, though not exhaustively, Damn, everything's going wrong. made great efforts to keep the famine out of the press, which prevented the possibility of international aid that could have saved lives. Mm. What nice. is beyond debate is the devastating impact the hmm. famine had on the people of Bengal. The British inquiry into the famine noted a breakdown of family units as Golly. husbands deserted wives and wives' husbands. Whoa. Elderly dependents were left behind in villages. Babies and young children were sometimes abandoned. That's Historian up. Dr. Janam Mukherjee describes the hellscape that Bengal became. No kidding. Corpses lay scattered over several thousand square miles of devastated land. 7,400 villages were partly or wholly destroyed by the storm. Cholera, dysentery, and storms? other waterborne it's just diseases. Like everything flourished. going wrong. As the Weather, Japanese disease, postured like, and people starved in the streets, social pressures began to mount. Politics in India did not stop with the declaration of war, and mm. Indian nationalism only intensified as British administrators fumbled and fumbled again. The discussion was dominated oh, by Mahatma Gandhi's Indian National Congress, drawn from the Hindu majority of Indians, and oh. Muhammad Ali Jinnah's Muslim League, who feared becoming second-class citizens in an independent India. As time wore on, the INC began to emphasize Hinduism as a critical component to Indian society, leading to the Muslim League's Lahore Resolution, calling for separate Muslim and Hindu states. Okay. This marked the effective end of cooperation between the two, and Indian nationalists were driven into the arms of militant extremist leaders. Yeah, there's a lot going These on in India during World War II. These forces, Jeez. such as the Indian National Army, led by Subhas Chandra Bose. 
Bose grew the INA to 43,000 members at its peak, rallying the disaffected Indians Damn. with his promise, give me blood and I will give you freedom. The INA would go on to fight in Burma against the British, collaborating with the Japanese until the war's end. No kidding. Dang, I did, did not Indians know that either. Other chose less drastic methods of expressing their displeasure <laughs> with the British. As numbers of British and American troops in India swelled, cultural clashes and outright crime ensued. American troops mm. began slaughtering cattle, held sacred in Hinduism, while allegations of... So, I, yeah, I guess, so the Americans were probably there, like they're saying, staging for, like, the Pacific, so... Again, that makes sense, but I didn't even know that we had Americans in India at all, so <laughs> I'm learning a lot just from the American history perspective. Sexual assault scandalized the Indian population. Mm. Gandhi and the INC responded by issuing the Quit India Resolution in August of 1942, a largely symbolic call for India to cease cooperation with the British until they guaranteed independence. The British responded by arresting Gandhi and many INC leaders, who they would hold for three years. Okay. Gandhi, even from prison, exhorted his followers to peaceful protest. Instead, now it's kind of coming together to what I was actually taught in, in school, because we learned a little bit about Gandhi, but as far as like what he was really fighting for, I wasn't really too savvy on. And as far as like the stuff leading up to it, I wasn't really too savvy on. So we're kind of seeing all that coming into play now. Indian independence movement chose violence. Protests in Bombay saw 33 people killed by police in the four days following the INC leadership's arrest, hmm. and a wave of attacks on government buildings ensued. The British cracked down hard, and 2,500 Indians were killed. The Raj ultimately Damn, succeeded in putting down the insurrection, on. and Indian independence would have to wait until the war was won. This is all While during the World War II, the too. Indian people, the Japanese fought the Indian army. Indian troops managed to reclaim some of Burma in December of 1942. Nice. And the Japanese responded by bombing Calcutta for several days. Mm. Most Not of nice. 1943 in India would be dedicated to reorganization and rearming of the Indian army, as mm. the Japanese had taught the Raj a bloody lesson. They were not ready to face the Japanese in open battle. While troops in the subcontinent readied to defend their home, Indians abroad helped liberate North Africa before participating in Operation Husky, <laughs> seeing yeah. action throughout Sicily. Okay. As 1943 mm. drew to a close, the reinvigorated Indian army prepared to march against the Japanese. The nice. Japanese watched the Indian revitalization with concern and decided they needed to you once should, again yeah. launch a surprise attack to keep the initiative. Hmm. In March of 1944, they enacted their plan, dubbed Operation Yugo, which saw intense fighting on the Burmese border. The hmm. Indians stood against the Japanese at the border towns of Imphal and Kohima. The determined Indians stood their ground against the Japanese invasion, and come July, their foe had no choice but to break off the attack. Nice. The Indian National Army, under Bose, fought in the Japanese attack, and along with civilian collaborators, rendered aid and comfort to the retreating Damn, Japanese. They're getting stuff done. As the Allies gave chase to the Japanese and encountered these collaborators, they chose honey over vinegar, sending doctors and food supplies to the isolated villages that had helped the Japanese. Hmm. In this way, they hoped to win the locals back to the Allied side rather than punish them for collaborating. That's, that's a cool way of August doing it. August brought an ally drive deep into Burma, and the bloody and brutal campaign to liberate the country merits its own video. Regardless, yeah, no May of 1945 saw the Indian army successfully capture the Burmese capital. For India, the war was over. That's cool. And the end could not have come soon enough. Food shortages were rampant even after the oh, official man. end of the Bengal famine in 1944, and basic necessities like cloth were in equally short supply. Demobilization meant an epidemic of unemployment as war workers were unceremoniously laid off. Members of the INA were arrested and interrogated, but public oh, outcry snap. saw many of them spared prosecution. Some okay. Indians. Damn, so. <laughs> The, okay, so the war aspect is a completely different thing. That's pretty cool to see how they're actually pushing the Japanese out and whatnot. But then, like, the political aspect, there is just so much going on. And I'm not too savvy on politics in general. I think you guys know that by now. But, yeah, as far as trying to keep track of all the, you know, stuff that was happening in India on the political realm or in the political realm, 
yeah, there's no way that they can try and contain all of that in one video, especially when they're just talking about World War II from India's perspective. But I guess it was a very key point in India's you know, history as far as getting to, to that independence. So it is kind of cool. So we're learning a lot from, you know, World War II from India's perspective, but also from, you know, what was actually really leading up to India's independence. All the INA as a legitimate member of the independence movement rather than Japanese Quislings. Speaking of independence, the British agreed to discussions with Indian leaders regarding the possibility of Indian statehood and released mm. political prisoners as an opening gesture, okay. including Gandhi. Nice. Independence soon became an inevitability, and Indian statehood talks opened. Tensions between Hindus and Muslims were a key issue of the negotiations, leading to an agreement to partition the colonial territory into the Hindu state of India and the Muslim states of Pakistan and East Pakistan. Now no- Oh, I was about to say, what the heck is East Pakistan? Bangladesh, duh. Okay, wow. So there's a Pakistan and an East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. Okay. Known as Bangladesh. Hmm. We're learning a lot, for sure. The results of these negotiations are outside the scope of our discussion today, but suffice mm. to say, the liberated colony would experience some growing pains. India would go into the Second World War as a colony and emerge a pair of nations. Nice. In terms of military dead, India lost 87,000 soldiers in the fight against the Axis, hmm. but accounting for civilian dead in the Bengal famine and other incidents, yeah, the death toll rises to a staggering 2.2 million at a minimum. The hmm. Indian economy was devastated by the war, despite being on the winning side, and the country remains economically troubled into the modern day. Nevertheless, India yeah, was true. able to throw off the shackles of colonialism, kicking off a wave of decolonization in the aftermath of the Second World War. It is no hyperbole mm. to say that Indian troops and materiel were a substantial contribution to the total Allied war effort. Oh, yeah. A contribution paid for in the spilled blood and empty stomachs of those living on the subcontinent. Mm. Damn, we learned a lot from this video. Holy cow. I gotta say, Armchair Historian, if you guys haven't subscribed to that channel, you definitely have to go and check it out because they do some very awesome stuff. Okay, so I gotta say, when I was in the Imperial War Museum, there was a lot of Victoria Crosses from like Indian personnel. So I'm looking up right now. So I guess the Victoria Cross was awarded to 153 members of the British Indian Army. So... Yeah, that's, that's a lot. And I got to say most of that, yeah, that was from 1857 to 1947. So in 90 years, 153 Victoria Cross recipients. So it's pretty awesome. There's definitely a lot of, a lot of badasses coming from the British Indian Army. So it's kind of cool. But yeah, I got to say, I did see a lot when I went to the Imperial War Museum. So it was kind of cool to read some of those like little stories, some of the citations they actually had there. But yeah, okay, so we definitely learned a lot from this video. A lot of the, the politics as far as what was leading up to India's independence, but also their role in World War II fighting, you know, with and, and kind of for the British. But again, from all those in the UK, let me know what you guys actually learn about all the different colonies and whatnot. So of course, like, you're going to learn a little bit about the US because that was a colony, but you guys had so many different colonies and, and territories and whatnot. So I imagine you only learn a little bit in the time that you're going through school, but let me know what you what you learn about, especially which colonies you learn the most about. Because as an American pr perspective, I'd imagine you learn a lot about, you know, America, but British history in general is just so long. So I'm not sure if you guys have that much time in general to learn about the colonies. And of course, if you guys have any other recommendations, please throw it down below, especially stuff about India before they actually gained their like independence from, from Great Britain and whatnot. That'd be kind of cool to learn about, but I learned a lot from this. Hopefully you guys did too. It's cool. Again, I like doing these reaction videos so we can sort of learn a little bit about a bunch of different stuff together. But yeah, there's a whole lot that goes into it. So we're not going to learn all of it, but it's cool to get some exposure for sure. But that is it for this video. I will see y'all in the next one.